bring in the jury. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Did any of you read, see, or hear anything about this case on the media? Please raise your hand if you did. Did anyone attempt to speak with you about this case? If so, please raise your hand. I see no hands. This time we will have an additional bailiff sworn. You do solemnly swear to take charge of this jury and protect their deliberations from all outside interference, so help you God. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to begin the aggravating factor phase of this trial. The bailiff has some instructions for you. She will be handing those out at this time. The instructions you are receiving are your copies. Feel free to make any notes you would like on your copy. Your copy will be shredded at the end of the trial. I'm going to read the instructions to you. I invite you to follow along with me. You have found Jody Arias guilty of first degree murder. During this phase of the trial, you will be asked to decide whether the state has proven an aggravating circumstance that would make Ms. Arias eligible for the death penalty. If the jury unanimously decides beyond a reasonable doubt that an aggravating circumstance exists, the trial will proceed to the next phase to determine whether the appropriate sentence is a life sentence or the death penalty. You were allowed to discuss the case among yourselves during your deliberations on the guilt phase of the trial. You must now stop your discussions about the case until you formally deliberate again. In other words, the admonition is in full force and effect again. Do not form final opinions about any fact or about the outcome of the case until you have heard and considered all of the evidence, the closing arguments, and the instructions on the law. Keep an open mind. Form your opinions only after you have had an opportunity to discuss the case with each other in the jury room at the end of this phase of the trial. The law that applies to this hearing is stated in these instructions, and it is your duty to follow all of the instructions. You must not single out certain instructions and disregard others. The evidence you shall consider consists of the testimony already presented and exhibits that have already been admitted, as well as any other evidence that may be presented during this phase. It is the duty of the court to rule on the admissibility of evidence. You shall not concern yourselves with the reasons for these rulings. You shall disregard questions and exhibits that were withdrawn or to which objections were sustained. Evidence that was admitted for a limited purpose shall not be considered for any other purpose. You shall disregard testimony and exhibits the court has not admitted or the court has stricken. The lawyers may st stipulate certain facts exist. This means both sides agree those facts do exist and are part of the evidence. You are to treat a stipulation as any other evidence. You are free to accept it or reject it in whole or in part, just as any other evidence. In deciding whether an aggravating circumstance exists, you are not to be swayed by mere sentiment, conjecture, sympathy, passion, prejudice, public opinion, or public feeling. Race, color, religion, national ancestry, gender, or sexual orientation should not influence you. I do not mean to indicate any opinion regarding the facts or what your verdict should be by these instructions, nor by any ruling or remark that I have made. Performance of your duties as jurors is vital to the administration of justice. 
you are to apply the law to the evidence and in this way decide whether the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that an aggravating circumstance exists. In reaching your verdict in this phase, you are not to consider the possible punishment. Evidence may be direct or circumstantial. Direct evidence is the testimony of a witness who saw, heard, or otherwise sensed an event. Circumstantial evidence is the proof of a fact or facts from which you may find another fact. The law makes no distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence. It is for you to determine the importance to be given to the evidence, regardless of whether it is direct or circumstantial. In deciding the facts of this case, you should consider what testimony to accept and what to reject. You may accept everything a witness says, or part of it, or none of it. In evaluating testimony, you should use the tests for truthfulness that people use in determining matters of importance in everyday life, including such factors as the witness's ability to see or hear or know the things the witness testified to, the quality of the witness's memory, the witness's manner while testifying, whether the witness had any motive, bias, or prejudice, whether the witness was contradicted by anything the witness said or wrote before trial or by other evidence, and the reasonableness of the witness's testimony when considered in the light of the other evidence. Consider all of the evidence in the light of reason, common sense, and experience. A witness qualified as an expert by education or experience may state opinions on matters in that witness's field of expertise and may also state reasons for those opinions. Expert opinion testimony should be judged just as any other testimony. You are not bound by it. You may accept it or reject it in whole or in part, and you should give it as much credibility and weight as you think it deserves considering the witness's qualifications and experience, the reasons given for the opinions, and all the other evidence in the case. During this phase of the trial, the parties are allowed to rely on the evidence already presented and argue about whether the aggravating circumstance has been proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt. Neither side is required to call witnesses for this phase. You may make your determination based upon the evidence previously admitted. The defendant is not required to testify or produce evidence of any kind. The decision on whether to testify or produce evidence is left to the defendant acting with the advice of her attorneys. The defendant's decision not to testify or produce evidence is not evidence of the existence of any aggravating circumstance. The prosecutor has the right to open and close the argument because the state has the burden of proof. What is said in closing arguments is not the law, nor is it evidence, but it may help you to understand the law and the evidence. The state has alleged that the defendant is eligible for the death penalty because of the aggravating circumstance that the murder was committed in an especially cruel manner. The law recognizes that all first-degree murders are to some extent cruel. However, this aggravating circumstance cannot be found to exist unless the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the murder was especially cruel. Especially means unusually great or significant. The term especially cruel focuses on the victim's pain and suffering. To find that the murder was committed in an especially cruel manner, you must find that the state has proven, one, the victim consciously suffered physical or mental pain, distress, or anguish prior to death, and two, the defendant must know or should have known that the victim would suffer. In determining whether an aggravating circumstance is proven, you may consider only the aggravating circumstance listed in these instructions. The state has the burden of proving any alleged aggravating circumstance beyond a reasonable doubt. This means that the state must prove each element of each alleged aggravating circumstance beyond a reasonable doubt. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof that leaves you firmly convinced that the alleged aggravating circumstance is proven. There are very few things in this world that we know with absolute certainty and in criminal cases, the law does not require proof that overcomes every doubt. 
if, based on your consideration of the evidence, you are firmly convinced that any alleged aggravating circumstance is proven, then you must make that finding. If, on the other hand, you think there is a real possibility that the alleged aggravating circumstance is not proven, you must give the defendant the benefit of the doubt and find the, the alleged aggravating circumstance is not proven. You must start with the presumption that the alleged aggravating circumstance is not proven. The state must prove any alleged aggravating circumstance beyond a reasonable doubt. I will complete these instructions with you after the matter is concluded. The state may now make an opening statement. She made sure of it. She made sure that she killed him by stabbing him over and over and over again and then finishing him off by slicing his throat. It is also sure that during this vicious attack, Mr. Alexander suffered. Mr. Alexander suffered pain every time that knife went into his body, every time that knife blade stru stuck or struck the back of his head, and when the blade went down to his throat, it was certainly also extremely painful. In addition to that, we know that he was alive in the sense that he was able to see, he was able to breathe, he was able to hear, so that he knew what was coming, forcing him to endure a horrific hardship, a horrific uh, view of the world, mental anguish. One of the things that you heard during the testimony in the previous proceeding was that the defendant attempted to commit suicide. And she told you... May proceed. During the previous proceeding, you heard the defendant testify about this uh, suicide attempt while she was in jail. The preparations that she took, the towel that she supposedly was going to place underneath herself for the to Your catch. Honor, Your Honor, I'm going to renew my objection. May we approach? back to the suicide attempt at the jail. At that time, you heard the description of all the preparations that she took. And one of the things that she told you, one of the part or the one of the aspects of that preparation was that she obtained some sort of razor blade and some sort of object that was very sharp. And she told you that as she began that, 
suicide attempt, one of the things that she did is that she cut her wrist. And when she cut that wrist, she said, I'm not going to go forward. She made a choice. And she made a choice to not go forward because it stung, because it hurt. She made that choice. Mr. Alexander did not have that choice on June 4th of 2008 as to whether or not he was going to endure a pain. Overruled. And his pain was much more severe than the one that she described, the one that made her stop. Each and every time that that blade went into his body, it hurt. It was more than a sting. It absolutely was excruciating every time that blade struck the back of his head. Again, objection, improper argument. This is opening statements. Overruled. Every time that that blade continued to cut into him, it hurt him. He was sitting in that shower there on June 4th of 2008 in the master bedroom shower. And there were some photographs that were being taken. And the last photograph that you see without any motion on it is when he was sitting there and you see the lower quadrant, quadrant of his body. And as he sat there, the defendant took a knife, a knife that she brought. And she took this knife and she stabbed him in the chest area. There were three strikes that she delivered as she, according to her testimony, was squatted down. The, that is painful if we are to apply the standard the defendant has laid out for us. And during that first portion of the attack, Mr. Alexander suffered excruciating pain. One of those uh, cuts or one of those stab wounds went into his heart. And it's something akin to a heart attack. At first, he began to lose blood, experienced shortness of breath, and then the t chest started to tighten. So in addition to the initial, if you will, stab wound, when the nerve endings are cut and he felt that pain, he was also beginning to feel the pain of his heart running out of blood as the blood kept seeping out. The other thing, as he sat there, was that he was extremely afraid. He was terrified. Overruled. One other thing, two individuals that testified for you previously were Janine DeMarte and Richard Samuels, both of them with PhDs. They talked about the fight or flight syndrome and that the reason that you have that is because you are confronted with such a scenario that, produce, that produces these actions. But it's because of fear that these fight or flight symptoms arise or that it's something that they discussed. And in this case, the person that was presented with those choices was Mr. Alexander as he sat there in that shower because he had already been stabbed. And so as he sat there, and after having been stabbed, had to make a choice. Fight or run. But he's laying or sitting on his backside, and he's already bleeding out, and she's got the knife, and the door is small as he sits there. So there is no way for him to really do anything other than what he did, fight, defend himself. And that's why you see on the left hand the defensive wounds. And what he tries to do as he tries to reach up is to try to take the knife away from her. And instead of being able to grab... Approach, please. Continue. You've been given the jury instructions to talk to you about circumstantial evidence. And the circumstantial evidence is going to show you that as he sat there, because of his defensive wounds, he attempted to grab the knife from her. But you also heard from Ryan Burns that this individual that sits here in court today is pretty fit, is very strong. And Mr. Alexander was sitting down in an inferior position to defend himself. So he reached up for that knife. 
and he cut himself or by the blade and he, as he grabbed it. And that also produced pain as he sat there and grabbed it on more than one occasion. Additionally, his right hand, he also has a cut in that. So he's sitting there. And now he's been cut not only in his chest, but he's also got these defensive wounds as he tried to fight. After experiencing this terror as he tried to fight, he sits there. Well, what does he try to do? Then he undertakes flight. He doesn't go into the closet. No, he then goes towards the sink and begins to get there or ambulate, walk, crawl. He gets there. And when he gets over to that sink, he's already hurting. He's already got the issue with his heart. And he's got blood coming from his hands. And he's got blood coming from his chest. And as he gets to that sink, and he looks, he can also see that this blood is coming down. Initially, he just looks down at it. But now he's able to see it. And there's this mental anguish associated with his blood running down. And that, and it's hurting. His hands are hurting. It's not like it's just a paper cut. It's much more than that. It's a knife that has gone through the left hand more, on more than one occasion, and it's a knife that has also gone through his right hand. And as he stands there with his hands on the edge of the sink, he sees himself, but he's also able to look to the back because of the reflective mirror. Objection, speculation. And as he stands there in front of that mirror, as he stands there bleeding in front of that mirror, not only is he seeing himself, which is extreme, emotional and mental anguish, he's able to see her in the back. Yeah, objection calls for speculation. Approach, please. You may continue. Yeah, and so he's at the sink. He's already been stabbed. Everyone knows that there's a reflection that can be gained from a mirror. Everybody knows that when an individual is standing at a sink, they're alive, they're breathing, they can feel, they can see, and they can think at that particular time. And we know that the defendant then approached Mr. Alexander from behind. She started to stab him all over the back, all over in the back of his head. And as Mr. Alexander endured that horrific punishment, he decided to flee. He decided to move away from the attack. And he started to go down the hallway 
and as he went down the hallway, the defendant was after him. He didn't make it all the way down the hallway. In fact, he made it to the area or the breach where the carpet started. And when he got there and as he started to go there, you can see by the rainbow on the wall that for him, that would be the end, and he went down. And he went down with his head up, facing up, so that as he sat there, he was still, or laid there, he was still alive, he was still breathing, he could still see. And the last thing that Mr. Alexander felt as he laid there, as he could see up there, was this knife, this woman, and this blade coming towards him. And it was only death that relieved that pain, and it was only death that relieved that anguish. And that is especially cruel. Thank you. The defense may make an opening statement. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at issue before you at this phase of the trial, frankly, the only issue before you at this phase of the trial is whether the killing of Travis Alexander, the killing that you with your verdict have determined to be a premeditated first degree murder, was committed in an especially cruel way. When you hear that issue posed to you, you may think, well, we've seen the photographs, we've heard of the wounds, we've heard of the slit throat, and think, well, of course, Argument. However, the question before you is not one of cruelty. We can all agree that what happened to Mr. Alexander was cruel. And as a matter of fact, in the jury instructions that were just read to you, the law recognizes the fact Objection that to Approach. Objection. Objection. So as I was saying, this isn't a matter of cruelty. The law recognizes, and what is in your jury instruction says, that all first degree premeditated murders are to some extent cruel. As you process the evidence you're about to hear, as well as the fact that you can consider the evidence that you've already heard, the question is one, is that meet the definition of especially cruel? In that regard, the evidence you're going to hear about these wounds that happened, this sequence of events that supposedly happened in 62 seconds, pursuant to what the state argued during this trial, is whether it is, and the language in your jury instructions is such that it was unusually great or significant. Unusually great or significant. Is it beyond this normal cruelty that is inherent in any first degree murder? That's the question before you. Talk about, there's two issues in that regard when you hear the evidence and when you consider the evidence that you've already heard. There's two issues. It is the pain and mental anguish of Mr. Alexander, but it also deals with should Jody Arias have known, or should she have known, or did she know that she was causing this? Now in this regard, and we'll talk about this a little more at the conclusion of this phase, we have to account for the fact, and as the state just brought up, the testimony of Dr. Samuels and as well as Dr. DeMarte, and you also heard from Dr. Geffner, about the synapses in the brain, about the flight or fright response of both these individuals. Because as you process this information and you hear from Dr. Horn talking about these wounds, the perception of both these individuals and how their brains were functioning in this time is relevant to consideration of this mitigation. Overruled. Mitigating factor. 
And when you consider what you're hearing through this filter, through this light that the jury instructions impose upon you that are not optional, that you must follow, you will come to understand that the state has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that this was done in an especially cruel manner. The state may call its first witness. Dr. Hong, please take the stand. You are still under oath. Do you understand? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a 10 minute recess at this time. Please. Be back in 10 minutes, and we will start promptly at that time. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Council, please approach. We are at recess.
Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Martinez, you may proceed. Your name, sir? Dr. Kevin Horn. Sir, um, generally speaking, what is it on the body that causes it to experience pain? Uh, well, it would be uh, largely due to damage to nerve endings or severing of nerves in the body. So, for example, in this particular case, exhibit number 185, what are we looking at here? Uh, several stab and, and incised or shallow, um, shallow sharp force injuries of the torso. Are there nerve endings in this particular area of Mr. Alexander's body? Yes. And with regard to these stab wounds, is one of those the ones that actually pierce the heart or not? Uh, yes, the lower um, right corner. That one right there? Yes. If this, once this thing pierced the heart, please explain to me what would happen, symptom, or what symptoms would Mr. Alexander exhibit, or what would he feel in terms of having the heart stabbed? Well, it actually injures a vessel leading into the heart, so um, as the blood began to leak out of that vessel and the heart began to fail, um, he'd probably experience uh, shortness of breath uh, and also pain to the area itself. We've heard of people having heart attacks. Is that similar to that or not? Uh, yes, as the heart is starved for oxygen in a heart attack, uh, that chest pain is similar because it's the same nerve endings that are being stimulated. Exhibit number 188, the lower portion. This is the one that you indicated to us was how deep? Uh, this is a wound that goes across the belly. Uh, it goes through the belly fat and does not enter the abdominal cavity, but it is a deep, deep wound. It's just oblique across the body. Again, are there nerve endings there? Yes. Do these bleed? Yes. Exhibit 193. What are we looking at here? Uh, multiple stab wounds to Mr. Alexander's upper back. And I think the way you described it previously was that they didn't go in very deep. That's my term. Is that correct? Yes, they impact the ribs and the spine. Just because they don't go in very deep, does that mean that there are no nerve endings that are being impacted or severed by these knife wounds? No. So there would be pain associated with that, correct? Yes. <laughs> Exhibit number 202, we're looking at this injury here. And uh, was that a deep injury or not? Not as deep as some of the others, but it goes into the, um, the deep muscle of the back of the neck and impacts the spine. And again, are there nerve endings there that would cause this individual to experience pain? Yes. If we then take a look on the right side of the neck, exhibit 200, we also see a similar type of wound. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, in terms of wh which one of those two is deeper? Uh, the first one. And, but however, just because the one on the right is not as deep, does that mean that the pain is any less there, or are they the, they're the same nerve endings on that side of the uh, body? Well, the deeper wound would involve more nerve endings generally, so it may be more painful. Exhibit 195, we are looking at the back of his head, correct? Yes. And the back of the head in the area where the hair is, are there nerve endings there? Yes. And in this, these type of uh, injuries here, this one down here, which one's deeper, this one in the bottom or the one on top? Uh, they both go to the, the level of the skull and actually impact the skull. When you say they impact the skull, what does that mean? Uh, there were actually divots in the bone underneath these, these injuries where the, the knife impacted. And when you say that they're divots, does that go to the amount of pressure or that was being applied to this, the, uh, this portion of the skull to go there? Yes. And a divot, if you can describe for me a little bit more what divot means to you. On the surface of the skull, uh, there are actually triangular portions of bone that have been gouged out by the end of the knife. Exhibit number 182 is the left hand, correct? Yes. And then exhibit 180 also shows us the left hand, correct? Yes. You had a term for those kind of wounds. What, were, what did you call them? They're consistent with defensive wounds. What is a defensive wound? 
uh, in the setting of a stabbing, it's the individual uh, struggling, attempting to grab the knife uh, or hold the knife or fend off blows with the knife. Exhibit 177 is which hand? The right hand. And right here is where we see a uh, cut, correct? Yes. And that would be the, uh, the right thumb, correct? Yes. Is that also consistent with the defensive wound? Yes. Exhibit 205, was Mr. Alexander still alive before that injury was inflicted? I believe he was. Why do you believe that? Because of the amount of hemorrhage that's in the tissue around this injury. And as we look at this, it appears that there is, my term, a scalloping. In other words, it's not an even cut, it actually goes up and down. Is that the tissue, or does that tell you something about the way this wound was inflicted? Uh, there may be some changes because of the decomposition that might affect the, the profile of the wound, but it may also be that there are several overlapping wounds in the same area or several attempts to cut the throat in the same area. And is this an area that is difficult to cut, or is this an area that if you just press a, a knife to it that's somewhat sharp that it goes through? Explain that to me. Uh, the skin would offer some resistance to a knife, so there would be some resistance there. Uh, the tissues underneath are fairly soft, but the airway itself is firm cartilage, so there would be some, some effort that would be needed to get through all of the airway and the windpipe. Once this wound was in, what did it go through? What uh, part of the uh, throat did it go through? It goes through the, uh, the tissues at the front of the throat, the strap muscles, the airway, and also the, uh, the major vessels on the, I believe it's the right side of the throat, the uh, jugular vein and the carotid artery. When you talk about the airway, um, are, we, are you talking about the voice box, that sort of thing? Just below the voice box, yes. And this individual, after this injury happens, before that, could he still speak? Before yes, this injury. until the windpipe is severed, yes. After the windpipe is severed, does the individual make any noises? Are there any noises that are associated with uh, the um, severing of this particular uh, area? Objection. Approach.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask that you go out into the hallway for about two minutes and we'll bring you right back. Please remember the admonition. We are recessed for two minutes. Record show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Martinez, you may continue. Sir, with regard to the injury to the neck, was Mr. Alexander still alive at the time of that injury? Yes, I believe he was. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. Good morning, Dr. Good morning. After the injury to the neck, the cut to the throat, uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Alexander would have been, well, it would have been a fatal wound within a few seconds, right? Yes. And within a few seconds, he would have, he would have passed away then? Yes. And after he dies, he doesn't feel anything anymore? Correct. And based on your previous testimony, you believe the gunshot came last, right? Yes. So if the gunshot came after he was dead, there would be no feeling from that? Correct. Right. The cut to the throat that we were just looking at, uh, you said that the bottom of the cut had a, uh, like a scalloped edge to it? It's irregular, yes. Okay, irregular. Um, but the top of the cut, the top upper edge was straight across, wasn't it? Appeared to be, yes. Okay. And what happens uh, when you're looking at these bodies after decomposition, sometimes the skin pulls away, right? Yes. And so that can be a cause for the scalloped edge on the bottom? Yes, and I mentioned that, yes. Okay, and that's what you've testified to before, right? Yes. The, uh, you talked about the stab to the heart or the superior vena cava, right? Yes. It wasn't actually hit, it didn't actually hit the heart. Right, it's a vessel leading into the heart, yes. Okay, and that, and that stab wound, that was also fatal, wasn't it? Would have been eventually, yes just not as rapidly as the cut to the throat. Correct. And that stab was fatal because it's, the blood is then leaking out, um, a major blood vessel, right? Yes. And so uh, you, you talked about how uh, the blood would, the heart would continue pumping, and as it's pumping, it's, the blood is leaving that, that superior vena cava, right? Yes. And when somebody is fighting or moving around a lot, their heart is gonna be pumping faster, won't it? Yes. And the faster a heart pumps, the more blood is going to be pumped through the heart. Yes. And the more blood that's pumped through the heart means the more blood in this particular situation is going to be coming out faster out of that superior vena cava. Yes. And so the more movement that you have, the more, um, the faster the heart's pumping, the more rapidly fatal that wound is going to be. Yes, in a general way, it'll increase blood loss. If someone's already losing blood, um, right. increased heart rate will increase the rate of blood loss, yes. Okay, all right. And you're aware from, from being a medical doctor that uh, when somebody is fighting like that, oftentimes adrenaline is involved, right? Yes. When two people are in a, in a fight, or even, well, when two people are in a fight, the adrenaline starts to rush through their head, right? Yes. And especially in this situation, as the prosecutor describes, if Mr. Alexander is fearful, he's gonna have adrenaline pump pumping as well, right? That's the normal response, yes. Okay, and adrenaline does that for our bodies to help us be able to fight, right? Yes. Because of that, because of the adrenaline, pain doesn't always register immediately with our bodies, okay. right? Approach, please.
You may proceed. Dr. Horn, being a doctor, you understand that when adrenaline is released in our, in our brains, all kinds of endorphins are, endorphins are coming, right? That's part of it, yes. It's okay. the fight or flight response. Right. And you're familiar with the fight or flight response? Yes. And you're familiar with what happens in the brain with the endorphins or the adrenaline coming in during fight or flight? In a general way, yes. Okay. And generally speaking, then, you're aware that when these things happen, it's, it's a protective mode for our bodies, isn't it? Yes. Uh, to help us have the strength to fight? Yes. And to help us to focus on surviving? Yes, that's true. And by focusing on surviving, we're able to focus on what needs to get done versus necessarily focusing on the immediate pain. Yes. Okay. And if some, the, and when somebody is, is in this um, fight situation, the adrenaline is going to also make their heart pump faster as well, right? Yes. And so the moving and the adrenaline is going to help a person to fight. Uh, I'm sorry, the moving and the adrenaline is going to help a person, um, is going to be making that person's heart pump faster. Yes. And in this situation, a heart pumping faster means more rapidly fatal with the very first wound. Uh, the, the wound of the heart we're talking about, yes, yes. but all wounds will bleed more, more copiously with more motion and with adrenaline. All right, thank you. Yeah. Regardless of the time that it took for this, all of these stab wounds to take place, was he alive at the time that uh, all of these stab wounds uh, took place? Yes, I believe he was. Was he alive when he was stabbed in the heart? Yes. Was he alive when he was being stabbed in the back of the head? Yes. Was he alive when he was being stabbed in the back? Yes. How about was he alive, in your opinion, when his throat was slit? Yes. Overruled. Yes. And so even though he may have had this reaction where the blood is flowing and there's the adrenaline that is going, he's still alive though, right? Yes, I think so. And does it, is a person who is alive, do they breathe? Yes. Can they hear? Objection, salvation. The world. If they're conscious. Assuming this individual is conscious, can you hear? Objection, salvation, facts, not evidence, speculation. Approach, please. Sir, whether or not he was alive. Exhibit number 98, take a look at it. Do you recognize what's there? Is that, is that a sink? Objection to Young's scope. Overruled. Is that a sink, sir? Yes. An individual who stands at a sink and bleeds over to that sink, in your opinion as a medical examiner, and I understand you deal with dead people, are they alive or dead in your opinion? Alive. And why would they be alive if they're standing at a sink like that? Unless they're being held there, they're, they're standing under their own power and bleeding into the sink. Sir, with regard to this issue of his adrenaline and whether or not it pumps and whether or not he's feeling anything, if the individual is alive and they're standing at a sink, can that individual hear? Objection, salvation, speculation. Overruled. Yes. If they're standing at that sink and they're alive, can they see? Objection, salvation, or speculation. 
of the world. Yes. Can they hear if they're standing at that same sink? Objection, asked and answered. Sustained. With regard to this individual, if the individual is standing at that sink and he's found down the hallway and there's no evidence, indication that anybody moved them, is that an indication to you that they're alive? Yes. And if the individual is walking down the hallway and they're alive without any help, can that individual see? Yes. Overruled. Can he hear? Yes. Overruled. Can he feel? Objection, speculation. Overruled. Yes. Can he smell? Same objection. Overruled. Yes. And can he think? Objection, speculation, foundation. Overruled. Yes. You were also asked, sir, about this um, thing about the adrenaline and that sort of thing. Just because an adrenaline may be present, does that mean that the uh, nerve endings go dead? Is that what that means? No. Does that mean that an individual who may have this adrenaline that's flowing, does that mean they can still feel? Yes. And this, you were asked about the, the heart and where it was cut and, and uh, um, whether or not there was some pain associated with it. Even if there's an adrenaline, uh, if, even if there's adrenaline that is being pumped through the system and this heart is, has had this injury, does that mean that the area leading to the heart still doesn't have the nerve endings? Are the are nerve endings still there? Yes. And would this individual still feel? Yes. And with regard to this, you were asked about this, Exhibit 205 and decomposition. Do you remember that? Yes. And you said, well, it could be that decomposition may account for the scalloping that we see around Mr. Alexander's throat, right? Yes. But it could also be done by something else. What else? Multiple overlapping wounds in the same area. When you say multiple overlapping wounds, does that mean that the defendant, when she did this, did it more than once? Can you describe what multiple overlapping wounds are? Uh, wounds in the same area uh, applied multiple times or, or back and forth in a sewing motion. I don't have any other questions. Looks like we have one juror question. Are there any others? Council, please approach. Dr. Horn, the jurors have two questions for you. Did you previously testify that Mr. Alexander had three rapidly fatal wounds? Uh, yes, the wounds that would have been fatal for this man would have been the stab wound to the heart, the throat cut, and then the gunshot wound taken in, taken in isolation from each other. In regard to the throat, do you have an opinion as to which was more likely to cause scalloping? decomposition or multiple wounds? 
Because of the decomposition, I can't say. Um, in, in a fresher state, you may be able to see multiple cuts through the, the neck muscles and other structures underneath, but I wasn't able to determine that, so I really can't say. Any other questions from the jury? Follow up, Mr. Martinez. With regard to the wounds, you did indicate that there were three wounds that were fatal, correct? Yes. Which three are those? Again, the, um, the stab wound of the heart would have been fatal in and of itself, I believe. The uh, cut to the throat with the vessels being severed would have been fatal in and of itself. And then the gunshot wound taken in isolation would have been fatal. And the injury to the chest, uh, in terms of how quickly, because we're using the term rapidly fatal, how quickly, in your opinion, if that was the only injury without anything else, how long would that take for Mr. Alexander to lapse into unconsciousness? Uh, the wound in the vessel is actually fairly small, so blood would have leaked out over time, and so it would have been, of the three injuries, I think the, the, the slowest in terms of fatality. Any, any time limit that you could put on there? I couldn't say, and again, it depends on all the other factors like activity and adrenaline and those things. Let's say that uh, there is no activity. Can you, can you time it or not? A few minutes, maybe more. The other injury, the one to the throat, was that immediately fatal? Very rapid, yes, seconds. So that's the one that took seconds, correct? Yes. Would an individual be able to, if that were the first injury, to be able to grab, for example, a knife, that sort of thing, if that were the first injury? Extremely unlikely. I mean, they may have been able to get their hands up for a second, but that would have been rapidly fatal. Would the first, if that were the first injury, would they be able to ambulate and go over to a sink and stand? No. The gunshot wound, you indicated that that was also fatal. Isolated by itself, in terms of unconsciousness versus death, how long would it take an individual to die if they received that type of injury? Without medical attention, um, it, w it would be fatal, I believe. I don't, I don't have a, a time frame that I could give you. And in terms of lapsing into unconsciousness, if they, that were the first injury, would the individual lapse into unconsciousness or not? I believe they would immediately. And what, what time are we talking about for this? Uh, seconds. They would collapse and become unresponsive. Thank you. Nothing else. Please approach. May continue. With regard, you talked about the first wound being the slowest of the three? Uh, the stab, stab wound to the, to the chest, yes. Okay. And you were given the situation if somebody wasn't moving at all. You thought it would take minutes to die if nobody's moving, right? Right. But clearly that would be much faster and much quicker if somebody is moving around and if the heart is pumping a lot faster? Yes, generally yes. So much faster than minutes then? Yes. All right, thank you. That's my judge. May step down. The uh, state press. Anything from the defense? The defense press, Your Honor. All right, closing argument, Mr. Martinez. She made sure that Mr. Alexander, that Travis Alexander, did not go gently into that hot afternoon back on June 4th of 2008. Not only did she make sure that uh, he went that way, he did not go gently, she also made sure that he went in a way that he was nude. And she accomplished this by the use of a knife. And she accomplished this, or did this, in a place that was his home a place where he was secure, a place where he um, was living, a place where 
was a place of joy for him, maybe sadness, all of the emotions that are associated with the home. And in this home, there was a bathroom. This bathroom had this shower there. And when she attacked him, he was in a vulnerable position. He was standing there with water coming down on him as he sat there. Earlier, he had been standing there. And as he's standing there, he's totally unaware of what's about to happen to him. And as he stands there, the defendant, who is taking photographs, and we know that from the camera because she deleted these photographs, comes nearer. And then he sits down. And as he's seated there, he's in a position where he's easier to attack. He's easier to attack than. You may continue. She sat in the chest, an area that she knew held the heart, an area that she knew that she could get to, and an area that she could see as he was sitting there up against the wall, if you will, of the shower. And so she got the knife, and uh, whether or not Mr. Alexander saw it, we don't know but we do know that he felt it. We do know that he felt it as it went inside here. And the reason that we know that he felt it is because he reached up at that point. You can imagine the absolute terror as he's sitting there defenseless, water coming down in a seated position, not even standing. And as he's seated there, this knife is coming towards him and is hitting him. That is extreme emotional anguish. That's extreme mental anguish to watch the blade come up to him. He can see at that point, he can hear, he can breathe, he can smell, he knows exactly what's going on, and he knows the person that's doing it to him is somebody that he has just been with. So there's this absolute mental anguish to that first part of the attack. And whether adrenaline is flowing, and whether adrenaline is not flowing, it hurts when somebody sticks a knife right into your chest. And the person that knows best about it, knows enough about that, is the defendant. She took one scratch into her hand, wrist. Oh, no, not me. That just hurts too much. She gave him no choice and continued to stab him. Using that as a standard, that she felt it was too painful for her to continue the suicide, you know that it is absolutely excruciatingly painful to have one stick a knife, to have her stick a knife right into Mr. Alexander's chest. And on top of that, not only does it hurt when it's going in, as this process of death is upon them, he's feeling the uh, tightness of the chest, and he's feeling like he's having a heart attack. And it just plain hurts this individual, Travis Alexander, as he's there, he's naked in a situation that he can't control. And he's still sitting down. And she's still standing there over him. She's still, if you will, in a superior position. What's he to do? He tries to defend himself. So he grabs the knife. And what does he get for his efforts in trying to get the knife? He gets more pain. Not only does he have the pain to his chest now, not only if they're talking about the adrenaline, is he feeling the pain to his chest, he can't even get away. 
And that, in and of itself, is extreme mental anguish. He can't get away from it. And people are familiar with paper cuts. This is a paper cut to the nth degree. He goes to grab that knife, can't get it. Goes to grab it again, can't get it. And he goes to grab it a third time, he still can't get it. And then he's on the right hand, he receives that injury. And this is all as part of the beginning. And he's now suffering, and now it hurts. They can talk about adrenaline all they want, but this hurts, especially to see now that your hands are bleeding. His hands are bleeding. His chest is bleeding. And he's there still in this very small area with this woman who, according to Ryan Burns, is pretty strong. Didn't let go of the knife, did she? Never let go of that knife. She might have nicked herself in the left finger, but that's all that happened. So he's finally able to get up. He's able to get out of that shower, wanting to get away. And as he's wanting to get away, now that the attack has sort of progressed, what is he thinking about? Is he thinking about his dog? Is he thinking about his family? Is he thinking about the grandmother, the one that received the 20 irises from the defendant? Or is, she, is he thinking about... Sustained. Who is he thinking about? Objection, improper argument. Sustained. May we approach? Yes. or trying to get out. And that's what goes to mental language. What's he thinking about to see himself bleeding like that? It's certainly not about holiday. Objection. Improper argument. What is he thinking about as he tries to make his way and begins to make his way from the shower over to the sink area? It must seem like a very long walk to him because he is now injured he is now bleeding and can't get her to leave him alone. Oh, yeah, he has this adrenaline going on. And, you know, that, 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 you know, that somehow takes away the pain. That somehow, somehow takes away the terror. Actually, adrenaline talks to fear. Adrenaline talks to terror. And that's exactly what he was experiencing, terror, at that time as he's walking to the sink. But he's also experiencing the pain. And he does get to this thing. Exhibit number 98. He does get to that thing. And his left arm or hand was here. His right hand was to the right. And he's over it. If he's standing there, he's alive. And if he's alive, he can see. And if he's alive, he can hear. And if he's alive, he can sense things that are around him. And that is a mirror. And a mirror has reflective qualities that allows you to look back at yourself as well as anything that is behind you. So when he is standing there, he gets to see himself for the first time. What a sight it might have been, must have been for him to see his Objection. face. Objection, improper argument, Your Honor. Oh, Lord. To see his face in that mirror. Was it contorted in pain? Was he screaming? He can actually speak at that point. Objection. Improper argument. Do you think he was silent? 
Do you think he was quiet as a church mill as all of this was going on? Common sense will tell you that he wasn't. And so he's standing there. He's getting stabbed in the back of the head, causing the blood spatter in the mirror. Not only that, as he's looking in the mirror, not only is he seeing his own blood, which causes this anguish, he's still in pain. He's getting this shortness of breath. He looks in the mirror, and then he sees himself, and then he sees the defendant again. She's striking him about the head with the knife, so he's able to see that. Doesn't, he has the mirror to see that. That's more mental anguish, more pain as he gets hit in the head so that the knife goes into his scalp and creates a divot. And that is painful. They may talk all they want about this adrenaline, but he's still bleeding. He's still hurting as he's standing there. And it must have seemed to him, they talk, it's a short period of time. Yes, it was. Less than two minutes. But if we're going to be talking about approximately two minutes, that must have been interminable for him as he's standing there and this is going on. And for demonstrative purposes, because they said to you, well, this is a short period of time. It's 11.38 and 20 seconds. Let's just sit for two minutes. And now he got his throat slit. Does that seem like a short period of time? No, that wasn't a short period of time. It was an incredibly long period of time to be continually stabbed, to be continually followed. And yet, he was here looking. What was he thinking about? Or maybe he was just feeling the pain. But it is painful. And we know that she herself indicated to you, I, didn't, I made a choice. I wasn't going to go there when I attempted my suicide because it was too painful. He had no choice. She gave him no choice. And yet she did know what was going on. And so then he begins to try to get away, walk down that hallway. Maybe by chance he can get out to that door because that's where he was headed. Down that hallway, out the door. Maybe he could get away. But he didn't have the strength anymore. He had bled out. His heart was, in allowing, was not allowing him to do that. And so he went down. At the time that he went down, he was alive. And he was breathing. He was seeing. He was hearing. He knew what was going on. And it is true. He, the last thing that he saw before he lapsed into unconsciousness was that defendant, this person here, with that blade coming to his throat. And the last thing he felt before he left this earth was pain. And so you're given a jury instruction that talks to you about what especially cruel is. You were told during opening statement, ah, 
That really isn't really too cruel at all. Not really at all. You know, it's only less than about 30 stab wounds. Only gets stabbed in the heart once, and then he gets his throat slit. That's not enough. Well, let's see what the law says about that. It tells you that the term especially cruel focuses on the victim's pain and suffering. Travis Alexander, on June 4th of 2008, suffered enough for two lifetimes. Two lifetimes because he was stabbed in the heart, chased down, and then he was, had his throat slit. Those two approximate two minutes that we're talking about, to him, must have seemed like more than two lifetimes. And to find that the murder was committed in an especially cruel manner, you must find two elements. Number one, that the victim consciously, in other words, was he able to see, look, hear, that sort of thing. You know that he was because he went over to the sink. You know that he started in the shower. Although he ended in the shower, that's really not where the attack took, where all of the attack took place. And then he went down the hallway. And we also know that when he got down to the end of the hallway, the defendant was with him. Not in a very good way, but was with him with a knife. So was he conscious? Yeah, because he was able to ambulate and go from one place to the other. Did he suffer physical pain? Yes, he did. According to the defendant's own admission when she was on the witness stand, it stings. It hurts when somebody cuts you. This is even more than that. This is a stabbing that is going on. And this is a stabbing throughout his, the back of his head, the back of his body, to the front of his chest, and then also the slitting of the throat. Yes, he did suffer physical pain. Also, this element could be met if he suffered mental pain, distress, or anguish. Is that something that was really pleasant? Is this something that anybody on a Sunday afternoon would want to go do? Any, any other individual, a reasonable person? Is this the kind of thing that they would want to suffer through? Where the individual that they had just been previously was coming at them with a knife. And they see themselves bleeding. And they see themselves being attacked in the mirror. And as they're trying to get away, they're not able to do that. They go down and they're laying there looking up absolutely not able to continue on with this defensive posture that they have undertaken. And as he laid there, unable to move, and the defendant comes over and he's looking up, how absolutely horrific, however you want to think about it, as the knife starts to come down, He's thinking, and he knows, and it's prior to death. And we also know that at that time, the defendant slit his throat. The other element is that this woman here, this defendant, must know or should have known that the victim would suffer. Because you could see the circumstance where somebody comes in, I didn't know. I didn't know that a knife wound would hurt. How? You could see that. But she was. At that time, 27 years old, she knows, how, she knows what's going on at the age of 27. She had previously received a cut when she was working, according to her. Or maybe she received a cut when she was at Mr. Alexander's house. Or maybe she received a cut. Objection and proper argument. I will. Or maybe she received a cut as she was stabbing him. So should she have known that the victim had suffered? Yeah, she should have known that. Any reasonable person would know that if you stick a blade in somebody's chest, that that's going to hurt, especially at the age of 27, when you are well along past your teenage years, when you're almost at 30. Yeah, she should have known it would hurt. Should she have known that if she continued to stab him in the back of the head and in, and in the back, would that hurt? Absolutely. The item that she was using and the way she was using it was meant to spill blood, and caused death, and it hurt. And then when she went for the throat, yeah, throats are sensitive. She knew her throat was sensitive, and yet that's where she went, and that's where she cut him. She knew. Every step of the way, she knew. Every step of the way, as she's stabbing him, she knows that Mr. Alexander is hurting, she knows that Mr. Alexander, every time it goes in, there are nerve endings there. She doesn't know the science of it, perhaps, but she knows. 
This is the woman with the high IQ. She knows. She knows what's going to happen when you stick a knife somewhere. She's very directed. It goes to the neck. She knows what she's doing. So not only does she know about it, she should have known about it. And those are the two elements that the state has presented to you, and those are the two elements that the state has proven to you today. It doesn't matter that Mr. Alexander may have been, to use their terms, may have been in fear, and that, that adrenaline was going on, and that the first element was satisfied. That's sort of what they were indicating with, with uh, Dr. Horn. It doesn't matter. She should have known. She should have known how much he was suffering, and he was suffering. He was suffering because it hurt, and he was suffering mental anguish, and he suffered all the way until he died, until she put him into another life, and that is especially cruel. Thank you. Mr. Nomi. Ladies and gentlemen, it is obviously perhaps an untenable position, one you never thought you'd find yourself in before you walked in here for jury duty, where you'd be determining whether something is cruel or especially cruel, right? But this is the duty that's been cast upon you now. And as hard as it might be, given the pictures, given the nature of everything, and given the pain we see in this room, we hear in this room, you have to be mindful, ladies and gentlemen, of your jury instructions. The last paragraph of page three tells you that you are not to be swayed by sentiment, sympathy, passion or prejudice, public opinion and other things as well. You must make a detached, objective judgment of whether or not the state has proven this aggravating factor to you beyond a reasonable doubt. In that regard, your duty as jurors is to detach yourself from that emotion, from that passion, And ask yourself whether or not, as we can see on page 7 of your jury instructions, the state has given you proof beyond a reasonable doubt. This isn't a probably. It's not, you know, the state doesn't have to come over every doubt, but it's more than probably. It's more than speculation. It's more than, oh, maybe she'd know, maybe she didn't know. I think she probably did. You have to be firmly convinced. And as the second sentence in the, excuse me, the last sentence in the paragraph says, if on the other hand you think there's a real possibility that the alleged aggravating circumstances is not proven, you must give the defendant the benefit of the doubt that the alleged circumstance is not proven. As it relates to this circumstance, Keep in mind, as we spoke about earlier this morning, especially means unusually great or significant, and that all first-degree murders are cruel to some extent. Now, we have two elements, as has just been discussed with you. That the victim consciously suffered mental pain, distress, or anguish prior to death. Now, some things have changed in what the state has told you in the last phase of this trial to this, to this phase, right? You remember during the arguments and, and the evidence presented to you in the first phase of the trial, all this happened in 62 seconds. And part of the argument was that there's no way Ms. Arias' story could have been true because all this happened in 62 seconds. And now the state decides, well, it's more convenient to expand the time. So let's make it two minutes. The theory changes to expand the time. They have you sit through two minutes. 
to play on your emotion, your sympathy, not what you're supposed to base the decision on. The other thing that's changed, right? We heard from Dr. Horn, who did, and through the testimony of Detective Flores, there were different versions of events. Remember, Detective Flores testified that the shot came first, testified in a proceeding, sworn testimony. Then he said he was mistaken. Detective Horn, or excuse me, Dr. Horn, then tells you, well, if the shot came first, he would have been unconscious. So ladies and gentlemen, let me first say, I would submit to you that if the shot came first, if you believe that was the case, then he is not conscious and therefore not suffering in the way that must be, that must exist for this aggravating factor to be proven. The next issue with this doctor's testimony, as well as the testimony of Dr. DeMarte and Dr. Samuels, they all talked about fight or flight. They all agreed in one form or another that it was a scientifically viable phenomenon. And you heard from Dr. Samuels, and, and, and I, should say, I should include Dr. Geffner in this as well, we talked about how the brain reacts to that, the subject of adrenaline. And Dr. Horn, who testified just moments ago, told you that the adrenaline does, in fact, prevent the body from experiencing the pain. This flight or fight is real, and you have to ask yourself when you talk about proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Going back to being firmly convinced. Have you been given proof beyond a reasonable doubt? Are you firmly convinced that adrenaline wasn't kicking in and when exactly Mr. Alexander lost consciousness? As tough as that might be to examine, that is the task before you today when, the, when this aggravating factor is submitted to you. The other issue is the, the, the second factor that the state must prove, again, beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant must know or should have known that the victim would suffer. And as proof of that, that Miss Arias knew that. The state says, well, she should have known that because when she committed suicide or attempted to commit suicide, months later, after her arrest in the Wairika jail, she experienced the pain of the razor blade. Now, of course, during the first phase of the trial, he, the state decided that that didn't happen. Now it's more convenient, it happened. The other thing is, in terms of the state trying to, to fool you, be mindful. Don't be fooled of the fact that this happened months, month, weeks after this event. This was after she was arrested, after she had been in jail for a while when she tried to make this attempt. The other issue we have before you not only deals with flight or flight, but the processing of memories, the consciousness in this area, because she has to know, or should have known, she has to be conscious in processing what is going on. That is another crucial element to which you must be firmly convinced. And that becomes the other issue. Because we have had Dr. Samuels, Dr. Geffner, and Dr. Horn talk about fight or flight and how that affects the adrenaline response. But what else did we, who else did we hear from? Now, I don't know if you agree with Dr. DeMarte or not. We take issues with her diagnosis. But she came in and speculated that Miss Arias had borderline personality disorder. She talked about some of the reasons for it, the detachment from her parents, the improper forming of, of herself, Things of that nature. And then she said, and she laid out all the reasons and said, one of the characteristics of this are these extreme violent outbursts. Now, if any extreme violent outburst, certainly there's no doubt about the fact that what happened on June 4th, given your verdict, it has to be considered an extreme violent outburst. 
And given that situation, ladies and gentlemen, I think you also have to give meaningful consideration to the idea, and if the state has proved to you beyond a reasonable doubt that one of these episodes, if you will, that Dr. Tamarte described wasn't what was happening on June 4th. Because if, if that's what was happening on June 4th, ladies and gentlemen, then she didn't know or couldn't reasonably know that that was happening because she was functioning under this mental defect that Dr. DeMarte says she has. So the ultimate reality, ladies and gentlemen, putting the emotion, the sympathy aside, and I know that's hard to do. These are the only, I suspect, the only crime scene photos of this nature that you have ever seen. It's hard not to react with emotion and sympathy. And the idea of separating cruelty, and especially cruel in this technical legal sense, is again, as I said earlier, something you probably never thought you'd have to do. But as jurors, your job is to detach yourself from that and say, given all the evidence, and you can consider all the evidence that you've heard, and the state's own experts telling you about Jody Arias' mental condition that they believe exists. That is, in essence, a concession that she didn't know what she was doing that day was causing this pain. It is, in essence, that there is proof that there is not, as I proof beyond a reasonable doubt that Miss Arias knew or should have known. That is evidence enough, ladies and gentlemen, if you have evident any doubt about that, that you are not firmly convinced that you must find that this aggravating factor was indeed not proven. Mr. Martinez. Previously, uh, during the closing argument, uh, I told you about how there was just going to be argument. Well, now that has expanded. Not only is there just only argument, but now it's an argument that's known as an ad hominem kind of argument, which means that rather than addressing the evidence, rather than talking about the evidence, what you do is you talk about the person that's delivering, the opponent. You talk about what they are saying. Objection and so, improper argument. Approach. They told you, or he told you, that the state was trying to fool you. Remember that? He indicated to you the state is trying to fool you. Additionally, he indicated to you that, well, the state changed its theory. We're not talking about the facts there, are we? We're talking about presentation. But they then say to you, you know, this couldn't have possibly have been a situation where the defendant knew or should have known that the victim would suffer. Because according to the scientists or according to PhDs that testified, she shouldn't, really didn't know what was going on. Well, if we're going to rehash that, even though we're past that point, let's step back and see what she did when she didn't know what she was doing. She knew what a camera was, and she knew which camera, because remember there were two cameras? She knew which camera had the photographs on it. She knew which camera she needed to go to to delete photographs. And it was a camera that she hadn't seen before or until that day. And she, in this state where she didn't know what was going on, started to clean up. And how did she begin that cleanup? By taking or deleting the photographs from a camera that she didn't know anything about. And she decided to move the body away from the door. Why? Well, because if it's near the door, somebody may come closer. The smell may go, go out. Objection beyond the scope. 
She then started to move the body. If she didn't know what was going on, how did she even know that she had done anything wrong? How did she even know that Mr. Alexander was Mr. Alexander if she didn't know what was going on? And then why undertake to clean up, use water, make sure that she changes her clothing, make sure that she puts the license plate back on? They want you to rehash that again. And that's, again, a tribute to the weakness of their argument that she didn't know what was going on. Of course she knew what was going on. The other issue was that, well, you guys didn't quite get it right the first time because in terms of the jury instructions, you were told that you needed to be mindful of the jury instructions and that you need to follow them in a detached, objective way. Didn't you just do that already? Isn't that something that you read the first time through? Isn't that something that you already know? Oh, but you need to be reminded now, right? Why do they think that you need to be reminded? Why are we talking about following the jury instructions when you've already done it once? Because they don't want to talk about what actually happened there. Why are we talking about this changing, if you will, of theories? Because they don't want to talk about what happened there. Then they talk about, well, you know, the state changed uh, its theory about what it told you about how much time. Dr. Horn changed his testimony about what happened. Why are we talking about change? Why do we keep talking about change instead of talking about what happened there? Why don't we talk about things like this, Exhibit 193? Why don't we talk about these other exhibits here? The one to the back of the head, Exhibit 195. And why don't we talk about Exhibit 205, Coup de Gras? They don't talk to you about that because they want you to focus not on this, the events. They want you to focus in on all these other things because under the jury instructions, what they tell you that you must be firmly convinced. And in this case, there is no doubt that this individual, Mr. Alexander, suffered. And he suffered immensely. Not only did he suffer immensely, one of the things that the jury instruction tells you is that he consciously suffered physical or mental pain. In other words, it can be satisfied either way. They're telling you, well, with this adrenaline, somehow that's something that you don't feel anything. Well, if you don't feel anything, they've now admitted because of the adrenaline, by definition, involves stress or distress or mental pain, that they, that element has already been satisfied. So then they say to you, well, the defendant must know or should have known the victim would, su would suffer. And they're telling you, these doctors that came in, these individuals, for example, Dr. Samuels, you know about his track record. With regard to uh, uh, Mr. Geffner, you know about what he's all about, the hired gun. They want you to, again, you saw the cross-examination, and you saw what uh, Bruce Geffner admitted to. Objection improper argument. Overruled. That's who they want you to rely on. No, the defendant knew or should have known that if you take a knife, you are going to hurt somebody, and you are going to cause mental distress. And in this case, yeah, the time may ha We don't know exactly what, how long the time was. You can take a look at the photographs, and you can go from one to the other, but none of the photographs show the first blade going, or the blade going into the heart, or wherever it was that the first uh, cut was. And they don't show the time when the throat was cut. So it is roughly a period of two minutes. And you can look at the photographs yourself. And in those two minutes, Mr. Alexander suffered immensely. He suffered physical pain, blood gushing from everywhere. He suffered mental distress to the point that only death relieved it, and that's especially cruel. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please refer to your aggravating factor phase instructions, page 8. You will now deliberate to decide whether the state has proven the existence of an aggravating circumstance beyond a reasonable doubt. All 12 of you must agree on the aggravating factor. 
All 12 of you must agree whether the aggravating factor is proven or not proven. Your foreperson will be in charge during your deliberations and will sign any verdict. You will be given one form of verdict on which to indicate your decision. It reads as follows. Verdict count one, aggravating factor, especially cruel. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn in the above entitled action upon our oaths, do find that the aggravating factor, especially cruel, has been proven, has not been proven, no unanimous agreement. You will check the appropriate box. The foreperson will then sign the verdict form and print his or her name and juror number. All right, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, the 12 sitting jurors will go back to begin deliberations. The three alternates will go with the bailiff to another area to wait. You are excused. Please be seated. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Council, please approach.